Well, if you have your Bible this morning, I'll ask you to go ahead and make your way to the book of Judges this morning. The book of Judges. In just a moment, we're going to pick up in chapter 1 and verse number 11. Last week, we did an introduction to the book as we looked at these first 10 verses. And I want us to pick up this morning, beginning in verse number 11, where we read, then from there, this is speaking of Judah, then from there he went against the inhabitants of Deber. Now the name Deber formerly was kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, the one who attacks kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will even give him my daughter, Aksa, for a wife. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. So he gave him his daughter Aksa for a wife. And then it came about when she came to him that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. Then she alighted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? And she said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have given me the land of Nagab. Give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. The descendants of Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms with the sons of Judah to the wilderness of Judah, which is in the south of Arad. And they went and lived with the people. Then Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they struck the Canaanites living in Zephath and utterly destroyed it. So the name of that city was called Harma. And Judah took Gaza with its territory and Ashkelon with its territory and Ekron with its territory. Now the Lord was with Judah and they took possession of the hill country, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had iron chariots. Then they gave Hebron to Caleb as Moses had promised, and he drove out from there the three sons of Anak. But the sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. And this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we bless you. We praise your holy name. We thank you, God, that you are the faithful covenant keeper. Even as we read in these Old Testament passages, we're mindful that you are faithful to keep your word. Lord, I pray that as we look at this section today, that we would be encouraged, that we would be enlightened and edified. Lord, let us see Jesus in this text. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, one of my favorite pastimes is reading. And uh, it's become very common within my family for different family members to ask me about a particular topic. Do you know a book on this topic or that topic that, that would be helpful? A few years back at a family gathering, my sister-in-law came to me, and she was uh, alongside of her. She had um, a cousin's husband, just try to follow along, cousin's husband, and, and, and she, she came up to me and, and wanted to know, did I know a book, he was a new believer in Christ, did I know a book that I could recommend for him as a new believer in Christ that would help him to grow? And, and I did not mean it in any kind of condescending way, but I said, yeah, I know 66 books that will be very helpful in him understanding what it means to be a believer, understanding who God is in the relationship. And she said, I, I know that. She said, I understand that. She said, but there have been many books over the years that have helped me, that, um, that have helped me to better understand the scriptures, to which my reply was, I, I, I agree with that. But really, without 
a basic understanding of the Scripture, without some kind of knowledge of the Scripture, the light that you get from these books, are, it's a minimum. And so, so the best way is to, is to read the Scriptures. It, it, the best way to, to get more understanding and more light is to have a, a continual habit of reading through the Scriptures, prayerfully reading through the Scriptures. And also, not only will that enable you to have more light and understanding, but it also will guard you from those areas in your life where when you do read about something, a particular uh, sermon or you know, something that you read that an author says and, and, and makes a point, the Holy Spirit may bring to your mind, well, what about this or, or what about that passage? But if you don't have that understanding, if you've not downloaded the Bible, so to speak, if it's not there, then you are susceptible to being drawn away. I say all that to say that as we come to this passage of Scripture, I think about uh, some 20 plus years ago when I was preaching through the book of Joshua and I had a limited understanding. I worked for what I had, but I had a limited understanding of what the Scriptures were saying. And it's not to take away from new believers that when we are new believers, I mean, we just, we just have to uh, we're, we're babes, and we have to understand that it takes a little while to grow in our understanding of the Scriptures. But now, when we come to the Scriptures through more and more light and through more and more time, it really begins to open up. We begin to see things that we did not see before. And so, as, as we look at this passage, certainly there is on a basic level, and we're going to walk through this, and we'll just kind of highlight what is here, but in, in doing so... What I'd like to do is just walk through the passage. We'll make some application as we go through. But then at the end, I want to bring in some things that I see in this passage that really point us to our ministry within the church, but also ultimately point us to Christ. Because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for Jesus in the Scriptures. And we noted this last time, that certainly all of it does point to Him. So as we come to verse 11, and I just want to do a, a, a walkthrough of this, the problem this morning is not trying to bring out something from the text. The problem is not that there's a limit. The problem is for me is that I've got to know where to edit. I've got to know where, where we can cut this off because there is a lot that is in this passage of Scripture. Well, looking at the passage, let me just remind you that coming into this, that we're reminded, and it, this is important because we noted this last time, that you see it's spoken of of Judah, specifically you see that in verses 1 and 2, and you see that in speaking about Judah that we're talking about the tribe of Judah. And so we, we need to understand this coming into this. We're not talking about the individual, we're talking about the descendants, those who are in the tribe of Judah. And we see the, the success of Judah. And then if you look at verse number 4, you see the reason for that success. In other words, it was the, the Lord who had given Judah victory over the Canaanites. And that brings us down to verse number 10, where we see somewhat of a transition. And so we ended off there last time. That's where we finished off last time was in verse number 10. And we noted that in this, that Judah is going up against the Canaanites. You see that in verse number 10, who lived in Hebron. And then we're told that Hebron was formerly known as Kiriath Arbor. By, by the way, just for the record, I, I've got a cheat sheet up here of how to pronounce all of these names. You're not impressed. But, I, I, but, but seriously, I, I mean... But it's not so much that we know how to pronounce them, but I think it is helpful that we understand that there is, uh, and you see this specifically in the Old Testament a lot. It's there in the New as well. But, but understand that these cities, the, in fact, the Kiriath there means city, and Arbor is the name of that city. It means four, but also Arbor that's mentioned there, is the personal name of the man who spawned the race of giants known as the Anakim. 
So we emphasized this a little bit last week, but in Joshua chapter 14 and verse 15, we read that Arba is called the greatest man among the Anakim. And in Joshua chapter 15 and verse 3, he's called the father of Anak. And we'll see that in a moment in verse number 20. I bring all this out to say that this is talking about giants. And so, remember that when we hear the story about giants, it ought to trigger in our mind because we've spent time going through the Scriptures and we know we're familiar with what happened when God delivered the Israelites uh, from Egypt. And you recall that after they had crossed the Red Sea, they were there in the wilderness. They sent the spies. Numbers 14 makes, makes this very clear for us. They sent the spies into the land. And remember what happened? That when they went there, it was the giants that they saw. They saw themselves like grasshoppers. We, we, we're like grasshoppers compared to these giants. And, and so... All of this is intro to what he's going to be talking about. He's going to introduce us to Caleb and his family, but the, the transition is this, is that Judah has been given victory over these giants. And where we see all of this fitting into the narrative is we're told that it begins in verse number one with the death of Joshua, and then we're getting ready to talk about Caleb in the next section that we know from the story that only Joshua and Caleb had the faith and trusted that the Lord would give them the victory. And they were the only ones that came back from that party of spies that said they believed that they could take the land because the Lord would give it to them. And Joshua or Caleb, we're going to be introduced to him in just a moment and do this. Go, let's go to Joshua, or let's go, yeah, Joshua chapter 15 for a moment. And, and I want you to see this attitude of Joshua there. Actually, let's go to 14, verse number 7. Joshua chapter 14, verse number 7. This is uh, Caleb there speaking. And Caleb said, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought word back to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear. But look at this. But I followed the Lord my God fully. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden will be an inheritance to you and to your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God fully. Now behold, the Lord has let me live. Just as he spoke these 45 years, this is Caleb, from the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness, and now behold, I am 85 years old today. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me, and my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and coming in. Now then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day, for you heard on that day that the Anakim, these are the giants, were there with great fortified cities, that's the four cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me, and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken." So, Mo, so Caleb here, and we can go back to Judges. This is the intro that Caleb there, as we see him, trusted fully in the Lord. And Caleb, all of this time, he had told, his report was that he believed he, by trusting the Lord that God would give them the victory. And you see with Caleb here, that all he can think about for these 45 years is, I want to go over there and whip them giants. Give me that land. And, and, and I say that to say that, that Caleb's attitude was he knew where his strength came from. He knew where the victory comes from. And so God had already promised that he was going to give them that land. And so when they are 
seeking out what territory they're going to be in. Caleb says, I want those giants. I want to go to that place. And, and this is the intro, moving into verse 11 through 21, where we're going to see about Caleb's family. Because what, what we're seeing taking place here, by the way, and I say intro, the first two chapters of Judges are really an intro to the book. And, and so all of this is going to draw from some of the, the previous history. All, all of this is placed together. And we'll see beginning in chapter 3 that the first judge is going to be talked about. But we see a glimpse of who that judge is here. In other words, Othniel is the first judge that's going to be introduced to us. There are 12 judges. We talked a little bit about this last time. There are 12 judges. One, each judge is associated with a different tribe. And, and just a couple of things going into this, because I think sometimes when we're thinking about the judges, we're probably, as I come to this, I'm thinking about, well, they judged all of Israel. But that's not the case. In fact, if you take, there's only 300 years of history there. And if you take the judges and the time that they served, what you'll find is it surpasses that 300 years. And so there's no way that can be that. So it must be that they overlapped. And, 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 and by that, I mean that they had a limited territory that they were over. We'll get into this as we get into the judges. But I'm just bringing this out. And there's something else to note is that they're, that they're not in chronological order. So, so Othniel, was, he, he's not the first judge. But he's the first judge that the writer is telling us about. And, and what we understand by this is that the writer, and we talked about this last week, he's, he's, he's making an argument here. He's, he's persuading us about something. And, and, and the way that he does that is he doesn't arrange everything chronologically, but he arranges it theologically, and he arranges it in a way that he wants to make a point. And we're going to see that point this morning. Lord willing, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. But, but I, I just want to walk through this, that he's going to introduce us to Othniel, but the way that he does that is he tells us a love story. Right in the middle of this battle campaign, there's a love story that is told. And it's already, it's told, it's already told in, in Judges as well. Or in Joshua chapter 15 as well. But here it is again. So he's drawing from the past. And here's what he says. Looking at, at verse number 11. It says that then there he went against the Inhabitants of Deber. Now the name of Deber formerly was Kiriath Sefer. But by the way, just a um, quick word of application here. Those, that Deber means word and Kiriath Sefer means city of books. And, and so what, what we derive from this is that this would have been the place where all the genealogical records, it would have been all the philosophical record, I mean, everything, it would have been where, where the whole civilization, civilization, everything, all their records would have been kept in this city. To, to wipe out the city is to wipe out the memory or the, the, the civilization. By the way, that's something that's trying to be done in America today, is to, is to wipe out the memory of our nation, to rewrite history. And, and we, as, as a church, we, we need to be aware of this, and we need to, to guard and make sure that this history is preserved so that we can pass it along, because we, we, we know that to do away with the history is to do away with the identity. And, and, and what we see in this is it would mean that this is a fortified place. It is something that's, that's going to be difficult to overcome. And this is where you see... In verse number 12, you, you, really, you really see how shrewd that Caleb is. Because, because Caleb's the giant killer, right? I mean, Caleb knows that to kill giants, you're going to need the Lord. 
And Caleb knows to take this great city, it's going to take somebody who is trusting in the Lord. It's, it's not just any normal person. And, and, and as Caleb is thinking about, who do I want my daughter to marry? I don't want, a, I don't, I don't want no sissy. I, I want somebody who is strong in the Lord. I, I want somebody who is trusting God. I, I want a man of faith. I want someone who is proven to be battle worthy. And so this is what we see. He, he, he makes this pledge that the one who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will even give him my daughter, Axa, for a wife. Now here's our first introduction to the judge, Othniel. It's the first time that we've seen him. He will be described in more detail in chapter 3, but here he is. And we were told that Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. So, so it speaks about his character. It speaks about him being a warrior. He captured it. And so Caleb, true to his word, gives him his daughter, Axa, for a wife. So then it comes back about in verse number 14 that when she came to him, this is the Othniel, that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. So th this is some type of dowry. And, and, and so she, what, what, what she does, I mean, he pays a price for her, but then she persuades Othniel to ask on her behalf. Strange verb there. She alighted from her donkey. That, that, that just means that she descended. That word will come into play a little later on in the book. But suffice to say that she just, she just slipped off the donkey and, and, and she goes. She's making a request to, to her father. And Caleb said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, give me a blessing. Since you have given me the land of Negev, give me also springs of water. So Caleb gives her the upper springs and the lower springs. Now, all of this, if you understand a little bit about the territory, and we could do that with a map study, she, they would have needed water. It's kind of obvious that that's what she's asking for. But Caleb grants this request. And so... And all of this, and we'll come back to this in a moment and, and, and see how all of this really, I think, points us to Christ. But there's something else that I've noted that the author is trying to persuade his audience, those who would hear this first. And I mentioned that before, that it's really about David and, and, and persuading the Israelites to crowned David as their king. Judah had already done it. If it takes place during that seven-year time span, then Judah had already done it. During the time of Ishbosheth, uh, the seven years, he, Samuel writes this and, and is attempting to persuade Israel to recognize David as the true king. So a couple things you see as we walk through the end of this Beginning in verse number 16, we're told about the descendants of Kenite. This, is, this speaks of how Moses' father-in-law, how they came into Israel. But I just want to highlight there that in verse number 16, we see something about Moses. And then in verse number 17, we see something about Simeon. And Moses was a Levite. And so here you have the Levites and the Simeonites together. And, and I want to bring out Levi and Simeon because if you know the Old Testament story of Levi and Simeon, the reason that they're having to align themselves with someone, with a tribe, and you'll see that at the beginning when we began this story, you recall that Judah says to Simeon to come along with me we saw that in verse number 3, I think it is, verse 2 and 3 there. And, and, and so the reason is, is that Simeon doesn't have a land. 
The Levites don't have a lamb. And so they, they had to come along with someone else. Simeon makes their way in with Judah, the Levi we see here. The point being, the reason that they did not have a land was because of the curse that was pronounced upon them when Jacob died. Remember? Y'all remember this? That when Jacob is pronouncing his blessing, and in that he, he specifically calls out Levi and Simeon because they had used... You, you know the story. It's in Genesis chapter 34. Dinah, Levi, and Simeon's sister, remember that she was raped by Shechem? And how did they handle that situation? They were supposed to, they were supposed to, uh, um, he was supposed to marry Dinah. And, and, and the brothers, Levi and Simeon, were upset about it. And it's because of the way they handled that. Remember they, they, they deceived the people that Shechem was a part of. His father was a prince. And, and they, de, they deceived the people. And remember, they said, well, if you want to join up with us, then all your men have to be circumcised. Now, stay with me now, because I'm going somewhere with this. Circumcision is the sign of the covenant. And what they ended up doing is when those men were circumcised, when they were weak, they went in and killed them. And because what they did was evil, what, what they did, they did something very evil. They, they took the sign of the covenant and they used it in the wrong way. And it was evil. And, and when Jacob is pronouncing his blessing upon his tr children... He points to that specific act because of the way that they acted in that. They were left out of having a land. Now, the curse was turned around for the Levites. I mean, they become the priests. And here we see Simeon, that he now, too, has found forgiveness. And, and here's, here's the, the offer of grace that we see in that, that there is forgiveness no matter what sin. There is forgiveness that is offered. But there is also a warning, and I think it's a warning to the church today. I know we get uncomfortable when I start naming names and talking about uh, pastors, and especially when we talk about pastors in the area. But I mentioned not long ago about Andy Stanley and what's going on there. And I want to say that just like Simeon and Levite, took the sign of the covenant and used it in a wrongful way. It is, it is just as ugly for Andy Stanley to baptize those people who have not repented of their sin to take the sign of the covenant and use it in the wrong way. It is blasphemous. Because when, when we are baptized, we are saying that we have died with Christ, we were buried with Christ, and we are raised with Christ. And, and we understand that when doing that, we're making a profession of faith, that we believe that Jesus died on our behalf. And someone who stands in the baptistry and has not repented of their sin, but is willfully living in sin, what a blasphemous thing to do to baptize that person in the name of the Lord. Here we see there is forgiveness. Is there forgiveness for Andy Stanley? Is there forgiveness for those people in that church? Certainly there is. God is a gracious God. But this is the warning. And you see that there are consequences for doing things like that. Well, we see how this ends up. There's so much here, and, and, and I don't have time to bring all that's here out, but let me just kind of go where he goes. That he talks about Judah taking, and you see the, the victor, victory of, of Judah throughout this passage. And, and again, it points to what the author is doing. He, he's, as he's writing this account, he's showing Judah that it's a reason Judah's first. It's a reason that Othniel's first, because he's a, he's a part of that tribe. And by the way, Caleb and his family <coughs> were not racial <coughs> Israelites. 
And they were Gentiles that were just like us that through faith in God were grafted into Israel. But here we see this Judah. And the summary statement that he makes for this section before he starts talking about Joseph and his, the descendants of Joseph in verse 22. You see the contrast in verse 20 and 21. It says, then they gave Hebron to Caleb. This is what we saw a while ago in verse number 10. Then they gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses had promised. And he drove out from the three sons of Anak. This is just another way of putting what has taken place there. But don't miss this. There's a contrast between Judah and Benjamin. Now, everything that we see thus far, except for verse number 19, has been positive. Verse number 19 at the end, we see that, that Judah compromised, and because they did not trust in the Lord, but they were looking at the iron chariots, they, they were not able to have victory in the valley. When God had specifically promised that he would give them this victory. But the contrast is this is that Judah is painted in this positive light. There's, there's one little blemish there, but other than that, Judah is painted in this very positive light because they have been faithfully, like Caleb, trusting in the Lord. And then you see in verse number 20, but the sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. And so what we see here is there's a contrast between Benjamin and Judah. And you'll see this. Benjamin, as you go through the book, you'll see that Judah is always painted in this positive light where Benjamin is painted in a negative light. What's going on there? Well, you'll recall that we emphasized this last time, and it goes back to the blessing of, of Jacob. That it is from Judah. Judah is, the, is where the, the, the line comes from. It is Christ who comes through Judah. But Judah is to be the priestly, or it is to be the royal uh, tribe that is a part of Israel. In other words, they're to be the ruling tribe. And, and, as, and I believe this is Samuel making this argument that Israel should recognize that David is to be the true king. He's been anointed by God. He's from Judah. And, he, and he's saying that Saul, who was from Benjamin, he's painting Benjamin in a bad light. Now, now this really comes to pass in, in, at the end of the book. You're going to see this. I mean, it, it, Benjamin, I mean, it is just ugly. Benjamin is, is, is comparable to Sodom at the end of the book. But there's two times that we see in the book where Israel asked the Lord. Look back at verse number one. Two times that he asked, they inquired of the Lord, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites? We see it here. And then you see it again in chapter 20, and verse number 18, where they ask again, who shall go up first for us to battle against the sons of Benjamin? And in both cases, the Lord responds with Judah. And so the book opens and it closes by saying that Judah is where the true king is going to come from. Judah is the one that is going to lead you. And it opens and closes with this very ugly picture depicted of Benjamin. It, it's really strong at the end. And in case you don't miss it, at the end of the book, over and over, some 18 times in chapter 20, he, as he's condemning Benjamin, he brings out Gibeah. Now, what's so significant about Gibeah? Well, that was Saul's hometown. So, so the point is, is that he's making a case that 
David is the true king. And so we, we see this, that David is the one who is to be the true king. And as you look at this, you see the parallels between David. David is the one, like Caleb, who is the giant killer. David is the one, like Othniel, who pays a great price for his bride. 100 foreskins of the Philistines. You remember that story when we were there? He's showing how he's a, a warrior. David is the one, as we see over and over, that when he's the one that's from the tribe of Judah. So all of this is pointing to David, but ultimately it points to Christ. All of this, ultimately, as we look at this, points us to Christ. And Christ is the greater Caleb. Yes, Caleb defeated giants, but Christ has defeated death. Christ has defeated the grave. He has been resurrected from the dead. I mean, this is the, Christ is the greater Caleb. Christ is the greater Othniel. It is through the, the word that Christ came and, and Christ who is the word conquered the wicked world. Christ who is the greater Othniel came and paid the ultimate price for his bride, which is he laid down his life. By the way, can we go too far with this? Perhaps. But I do think it's interesting that you see Othniel, who, who pays this great price for his bride and showing his love, that when the bride who wants to ask a question of the father has to come through the son now to do so, just saying, we, could we go too far with all of this? Well, yes, yeah, certainly we could. But all of this is meant to ultimately point us to Christ. Who is it that God has raised up for us that would lead us? Who is it that is the head of the church? Who is it this line of the tribe of Judah? It is Christ. And all of this, as we look to this going forward, is going to point us to this one whom we look to in faith. Well, I, let me ask if you would stand with me for prayer. And I'm going to close out with just this last point, and uh, I'll end where I began. Because I know that as I'm talking about some of these things, that it may be somewhat strange to hear about Christ being the greater Caleb or the greater Othniel. I know for some of us, this is new language, and we're not used to that. But we ought to see Christ on every page. And if we're not spending time in the Scriptures, if we're not spending time in the Word, if we don't know the Word, then we're not going to see those connections. Again, I think we have to be careful in how far we go with those things, but the point being is that we ought to see Christ everywhere, especially through the pages of His Word. The question is, is have you seen Christ? Have you by faith trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you looked to Him who is the, the faithful husband who laid down His life for His bride? And who are those whom he laid down his life for? He laid down his life for sinners. Have you come to him in faith, confessing your sin to him, trusting in him for the atonement that he has made on our behalf? He is the faithful husband. He is the giant killer who has killed death in the grave. And he is the one who has secured the victory for us. Father, we are grateful for the scriptures that teach us and instruct us, even on a very simple level, about your faithfulness to keep your promises. 
But also, Lord, your scriptures point us to the person and to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're grateful that we can see that. And we pray, Lord, that our mind would always be upon him. That we would be a people that walk by faith and and not by sight. That we would not lose the victory because we see iron chariots, but that we would know that the victory has been won through Christ. Lord, we thank you for the hope and the promise that we have in him. We ask, Lord, that you would be gracious to those who are outside of that hope, that you would reveal to them who Christ is and what he has done. All this we ask in his name. Amen.